Hello and welcome back to the Frogs of War podcast. I'm Anthony North and that is not Russ Hodges there in the other screen. Uh, we've got a, a new member to the Frogs of War podcast. Not new if uh, if you've been reading all his coverage on Frogs of War. Uh, we have Drew Carlton joining us tonight as, as Russ is unavailable. Really appreciate Russ last week uh, stepping in and doing a solo pod. I uh, came down ill and wasn't able to, to work it and... You know, this week, uh, the bug traveled all the way up to Chicago and caught it uh, with him. And so really appreciate Drew stepping in here to uh, to fill in this week. And, and we do have a, a loaded show for you. Two disappointing basketball games, uh, a brand new 2023 football schedule, some football news and uh, and, of course, tennis to close it out. But uh, first, Drew, how are you doing tonight? And uh, could you introduce yourself to the Frogs of War listeners? Yeah, doing pretty well. Like Anthony said, my name is Drew Carlton. I'm super excited to make my my podcast debut, and I'm ready to talk some TCU sports. All right, fantastic. So we'll just jump right into uh, to the pretty rough basketball week that the, the Horn Frogs had, um, and the rough stretch of games ahead. Uh, first off. TCU lost at Oklahoma State, uh, 79-73. And it's a game that TCU, frankly, could have won, probably in a lot of cases should have won, um, even without uh, Eddie Lampkin, even without Mike Miles, of course. Um, Big performances from the starting lineup, uh, big performances off the bench from Jacoby Coles, um, but some some empty performances as well. Uh, tough night for for Xavier Cork up there in Stillwater. Uh, another tough night for Rondell Walker, and and TCU dug itself into a huge hole that uh, it actually was able to climb out of, um, taking a lead late in into the final minutes, uh, about under four minutes to play. Took a lead on a Suleiman Dumbia layup. Jamie Dixon calls a timeout. Uh, I, I felt somewhat inexplicably uh, there. TC was rolling a little bit, and out of that timeout, Cowboys rolled off the next nine points and, and ended up walking away with the game, knocking down free throws to to close it out. Uh, Drew, what's your what's your first takeaway from uh, just from the Oklahoma State game? I thought that game was kind of a gut punch just to climb all the way back from I think nineteen down. It was just to take the lead, but end up giving it away there in the <clears throat> last few minutes. But if there was a positive to that game, I think um, without Eddie Lampkin being there and a little short on big men, I thought the lineups uh, with Jacoby Coles and Emmanuel Miller, uh, the small ball lineup that TCU was running out there actually had a lot of success. So moving forward, um, if TCU runs into a team that runs a small ball center or runs a small ball lineup, I think they can survive and have success running – Jacoby Coles and Emmanuel Miller as their two biggest players on the floor because I think it really opened up uh, the offense, kind of unclogged the painted area. You get five guys that um, that'll able, that are able to attack from the perimeter and keep defenses honest. It'll open up the lane to driving and cutting and just kind of help out with some of the struggles in the half court that TC has had on offense this season. Do you think that might be a starting lineup that Dixon plays with in the future if if Lampkin's going to continue to miss extended time or or not be clearly at 100%? Do you think it's possible Coles comes out as, as the starting at at the five position uh, rather than Xavier Cork? I think it should definitely be in consideration, especially when Baylor comes into town this weekend as they've got three super talented guards and LJ Cryer, uh, Adam Flagler, and Keontae George. You kind of take away the ability for them to get a switch onto a big man. I mean, Cole isn't going to – you're not going to expect him to lock up a point guard for 48 minutes – or 40 minutes a game. But he's – I think he's a definite defensive improvement when switching on to guards as opposed to some of TCU center. So I think – when you're facing a talented guard rotation, it can help on the defensive end as well as open up things on the offensive end as well. Yeah, TCU has really struggled in this in this stretch here. The Mississippi State game was an example of it. This Oklahoma State game was a little bit of an example of it. Of If a team rolls out there and has a couple of big men that can really score um, down low, like true bigs, um, they really run into trouble. I think 
I don't I don't know if that would have been a whole lot better with Eddie Lampkin on on the court. I mean, I think the way um, down there in Starkville with uh, the way Tolu Smith was playing against the Frogs, and then uh, I forget the guy's name now, but uh, the the two guys for Oklahoma State, Musa Cisse, and then. Yeah. The other guy that I can't think of his name, Caleb something, but um, Caleb they, Boone. yeah, Caleb Boone. They really uh, handled TCU, and and mm. um, you know if it's the kind of thing of if that's that's a team that that TCU runs into in the tournament. Uh, at, knock on wood, should the frogs continue win a couple more games and lock up a, a spot? I think still in safe territory. We could talk about that in a little bit in, in looking ahead, but it, it is a, it is a weakness there that, um, you know, some of those teams, maybe a, a champion from a mid-major conference comes in as a, as a 12 seed or, or uh, an 11 seed and, and could take out a team like TCU. So um, something to watch going forward, but really, yeah, like you said, the gut punch, I mean, this is a game TCU should have had, um, at full strength, it, it feels like it should be a runaway, um, and to, to not be able to come away with that road victory, it, it hurts. Um, but it's it's not a killer because in the Big Twelve, no game, no single game can be a killer. Everybody is so good. The metrics are so good. Uh, everybody is, you know, Ken Palm top thirty and the the average net of like twenty seven right now. It's um it's kind of crazy in the Big Twelve. There's uh there's no off night and you know this game for Oklahoma State was huge because they are now very much I don't know maybe even off the bubble. They're they're in in really good position to to earn their way into the tournament here uh, in the, in the last month of the season. Um. Let's see. Anything else? Anything else to say on the Oklahoma State game before we move to to the tough one in Manhattan? Not really. It's kind of one of the games I want to forget. But <laughs> yeah. Oh goodness. Yeah. Speaking of forgettable, uh, really the whole game up there against the the Kansas State Wildcats um, was it was it was not great. It was not a great game. Another loss. Another road loss. Um, and I think the final score doesn't really tell the story of the game very well. TCU ends up losing by 21 points. Um, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they were giving up down the stretch, but it was a bit of like, okay, this game is now over. Um, let's get back to Fort Worth. And what, what's again, TCU had an opportunity to make this a very, very interesting game down the stretch, um, cutting it to just a, a six point lead. Kansas State led. Uh, you know, most of the way, but um, cutting it to that six point game under five minutes to play, you have, you have a chance there. I think that very next possession from Kansas state is where uh, the, the Kansas state guard throws his elbow into Damian ball's face. It's a foul called on ball. Um, it, 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 with the accumulation of fouls, they're, they're shooting two free throws there already in the bonus. Um, and, and he makes those two free throws and then, um, just Kansas state goes on a ridiculous run to run away with it. Um, that team though is definitely built to, to go on these huge runs, uh, the way Noel shoots the ball and, and they, they can just all of a sudden jump all over you. Um, pretty solid games from Damian ball and Emmanuel Miller, um, but just a, a nightmare of turnovers, a really sloppy game, handling the ball, uh, matches the season high of 19 turnovers total, um, matches what they had in uh, in Morgantown in the loss against West Virginia. Um, it's going to be hard to win games like that. Uh, yeah, Eddie Lampkin just one rebound. Team gets out-rebounded by 12 uh, just uh, uh, pretty poor shooting as well. Both teams shot pretty poor for a lot of the game until Kansas State really turned it on in the final five minutes. But um, another one that maybe TCU comes away with, maybe, uh, you know, in, in Schollmeyer, there's some more calls go your way that the fans get behind it. And, and that that run comes there at the end for TCU rather than Kansas State. Um, but what's, uh, Drew, what do what were your thoughts there watching that Kansas State game? We, I 
think we just looked skittish. I think um, our guards especially feel like – I feel like the return of Mike Miles is going to just be a mental relaxation for the rest of the guard play because I think the TCU guards are playing as though they have to make up for Mike Miles. Like, oh, I have to make the, the perfect play every time, the perfect pass. I've got to set everything up. When in reality, we can – TCU has enough talent on this team to – win games and be successful without Mike Miles on the floor with everybody just playing their games. I think people trying to do too much led to a lot of turnovers. And I saw a lot of times just passes slipping through hands, which can also be a mental thing, like trying to do too much before you even catch the ball, just playing relaxed, I think at home and with Mike Miles back will hopefully lead to more success for the frogs in the future. Um, I think Kansas State's a really good team. They get out and transition and run really well, like the Frogs. And when we started to miss shots there at the end, um, they were able to go on that run in in part because of their ability to run the floor like TCU can and just get easy buckets in transition. Yeah, and uh, Mike Miles returning also helps by – you know, I don't want to be too hard, but uh, Rondell Walker, another – really rough game from him just in, you know, he did finally get his first field goal make in four games, uh, which was good to see, but it felt like maybe he thought that meant he had the green light. He had, he took seven shots in this game. Um, and that's probably not what TCU wants. Uh, that there, there were a couple really rough ones there down the stretch that um, turned into points going the other direction that, um, you know, it's it's hard to have those, and and it's you know he's was never really meant to come in and be an offensive playmaker. Um, mm-hmm. That was that was not the intended role. So he's stepping into right. something that that's probably outside of his uh, his comfort zone. And but it, it's TCU is in a tough position while Miles is out. That um, you know he he absolutely has to play minutes, um, but but they're bad minutes right now for the Frogs. Mm-hmm. I think one thing this offseason, I think he needs to go to the Jacoby Cole school of doing all the right things on offense, cutting super hard to the basket, shooting good free throws. Just You don't have to create your own shot as he's going to be solid on the defensive end and he's a solid athlete and a decent rebounder from the guard position. But I think he can learn to make – good cuts to the basket, be a solid finisher around the rim when he does get open on those cuts and just provide off ball action on offense when maybe he doesn't have the skill, the ball handling skills to create uh, his own shots right now um, to just learn how to help his other teammates out by moving without the ball and just learn how to create your own shots without the ball. Yeah. I think one silver lining in this game or one bright spot, I thought Micah PV played really well. Mm-hmm. Um, coming off the bench. He had 11 points, um, but also six steals. He was really active, um, a couple of assists as well. Um, he did he did miss a few three-pointers, but that's very much not his game. Um, and uh, But I, I do think he is he is a big piece off the bench and, and has uh, really contributed. I, I'm happy to see him... Uh, be that level of contributor here because TCU, he, he'll be a big part going forward as well. Definitely. Um, I think, yeah, I think he creates, he's such a good athlete. He can beat people off the dribble, just how quick his first step is. And that's kind of something TCU's missing, missing without Mike Miles, just the ability to create offense off the dribble. Yeah, let's see. I'm I'm trying to look at the stat sheet here, if there's anything that, that really stands out. Um, not, not really. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's one that uh, it's a game that TC was going to be an underdog, um, mm-hmm. and and certainly was not favored in the in the betting marketplace to win, um, but when you start going on losing streaks, it feels like the snowball is starting to roll down the hill a little bit, especially as the upcoming schedule is a a rival game against the top 15 team. And then in a away game against 
you know, in one of the, I don't know, five hardest places to play in college basketball against a top 15 level team as well. So uh, it, this this two game losing streak can very quickly turn into four game losing streak. And then you've got Oklahoma State again. And that that becomes a must win game if if you drop these next two. Um, so <laughs> some some difficult uh, days ahead for, for TCU basketball. But, you know, I think the big thing here is TCU is still competitive in these games. It's not like, yes, TCU ended up getting blown out by Kansas State. The scoreboard looks bad. Um, you know, hopefully Kansas State fans won't tweet at us constantly with the score like uh, like Georgia fans and all the SEC fans do. But uh, <laughs> I don't I don't think a regular season basketball game warrants uh, that kind of that kind of response. But uh, you know, I, I I do think TCU was competitive in these games, had opportunities to maybe steal a road win. Um, you know, but these. These are still considered quad one losses. This is not a a, a black mark, a, a big red X over your resume or anything like that. So um, still everything to play for for the Frogs. And the big thing to look ahead is it, they've been competitive in these games, but have had a uh, very obviously less than 100% Eddie Lampkin. And, and some of these games he's been completely out. And without Mike Miles... Um, I don't know that we have any real information on where Mike Miles stands in his return pro progress, but um, do, do you think when when when's your projection? When do you think he comes back? Does he come back before conference tournament? Does he come back? Uh, you know, do, or, or are we just kind of stringing this along, hoping that it uh, maybe the committee thinks that he'll play in the in the tournament? You hope he comes back before uh Big 12 tournament just so you can, I think, um, avoid dropping down all the way to, assuming we make it in the tournament, dropping down to a six seed or below. You can just show the committee like, hey, Mike Miles is back. He's ready for a March Madness run um, and show him that, remind him what TCU can be at full strength as we um, recorded some super awesome wins early in the season when we had Mike Miles healthy. Um, I don't know what the game after the Oklahoma State game is, but I think that would be my realistic. I like that. That's predict, a good target. My realistic prediction. <laughs> my hopeful That's Kansas. Prediction is, That's Kansas and Schalmeyer. That would be a good one to. Have that would him be back a nice for. one for him to be back. Yes, <laughs> definitely. So I'll, I'll say the Kansas game is when we see Mike Miles back on the floor for TCU. I like it. I like it. I think. Uh, I think I'd like to see him back for Oklahoma State. That would be mm -hmm. that would be great um, because I, I do think that's that becomes a really massive game, um, and you know, almost almost like if you lose that, you just concede Kansas so that you can go and and win in Lubbock, which is going to be another very difficult environment. Mm -hmm. um, but is this season is a team that is beatable even in Lubbock. Um, the other thing on basketball, I think if TCU were to win Saturday against Baylor, um, a, a Baylor team that's that's been rolling a little bit, getting healthy, um, Jonathan Chamwa Chachua, I, I hope that's close. I think that's pretty good, actually. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, is back and is looking really strong. So Baylor is... Baylor is scary right now, and if if TCU were to win that game, TCU should remain in the top 25, should probably move itself back up into a top four seed conversation mm -hmm. and, and feel pretty comfortable. But a loss against Baylor, even as good as Baylor is, I, I think probably does, you know, that, that, that puts TCU ha, – has been kind of trending downward in the, in the AP voting – I think it's possible TCU drops out of that top 25 with a, a loss at, against Baylor this weekend. I think it's definitely possible. I think uh, this Baylor game is super important uh, for for rankings and seedings for Mark Madness, but also if you're able to uh, pull out a win against Baylor, it affords you the luxury to just keep Mike Miles out as long as he needs to be and make sure you're not going to re-aggravate the injury when he comes back. 
um, and just make sure he's fully ready to go before you bring him back. Um, Cause if we beat Baylor there, I don't think there's a huge amount of reasons to rush him back for Oklahoma state. You can keep him on the bench for Oklahoma state and ease him back into it and bring him back against Kansas and just make sure he's at a hundred percent. You you get that luxury with uh, winning against Baylor, I think. Yeah, for sure. The, the one other thing that um, we wanted to chat quickly on, on basketball, if, if you have an opinion on, whether TCU freshman guard PJ Haggerty should be getting minutes and burn the red shirt to uh, to come out uh, and, and play some more games, he got a he got a little bit of run early in the season, played in maybe four or five games. Um, but I think Dixon's been pretty clear that he intends to to red shirt Haggerty and and hold him out for the rest of the season uh, until mm-hmm. next year is. What's your perspective on that? I mean, is this is this the kind of season that you need to just go ahead and put your best players on the court and and keep it moving forward? I think that would be my opinion. I mean, from what we saw from him earlier in the season, I think he's an immediate upgrade on the offensive end, at least, over um, Rondell Walker minutes. I think he's a much better passer, more confident dribbling the ball, and more confident shooter and competent shooter than uh, Rondell Walker on the offensive end. I think after this year, you're probably going to lose Mike Miles to the draft. You're probably going to lose Damian Ball to the draft. And those are two of your top, top players. I think this is this has been the highest expectation season for TCU basketball. And I think if there was a season to push all your chips to the middle, this would be it. Yeah, that was exactly my perspective on this as well. So, So you said it all there. You've got Miles this season. You've got Ball this season. This is the year. And unless you really intend to to hit the transfer market hard in the off season, um, it's tough to see TCU having a team better than its team this season, uh, mm-hmm. capable of having a season better than what this team's season is capable of being. So I, I agree right. with you fully. Um, but you know. That's why JB Dixon has paid the big bucks, and uh, and we're here on the podcast talking about it. So yep. you know, I have to have to kind of trust him on it a little bit, and and he knows mm-hmm. what's best for for the program going forward. Um, for me, that's all I have on basketball for the week. Drew, you have anything else on basketball? Any thoughts? I think that's it. Just all right. Yeah. All right. So. Um, the TCU football stuff this week. So we did finally get the 2023 football schedule release, the complete uh, Big 12 schedule uh, with all the the new faces in there um, with, with Houston and Cincinnati and BYU and Central Florida put into the Big 12 calendar and still with Texas and Oklahoma in there as well. It will be a very unique season in the Big 12. Um, with, with what will surely be a lot of intrigue, um, we can we can run through. Everybody listening to this has seen the schedule. You've already started making your travel plans. You're you know you you know when you're headed down to Houston. You know when. Uh, but I guess Drew, uh, what what was the first thing that stood out to you? What what intrigued you most about this this release as it pertains to TCU? A late October bye week was very exciting. Um, I think I saw a tweet that said this was the latest bye week TCU's had um, since joining the Big 12. And I think we saw it last year as a ton of players got banged up down the stretch as Quentin Johnson was dealing with an ankle. Kendra Miller was out for part of the Baylor game. Max Duggan was dealing with a hundred different things it seemed like. I think a bye week just to regroup before really a tough, November into the season, going to Texas Tech, home games against Baylor and Texas, and then going to Norman to finish out the Big 12 schedule. I think the bye week, just to regroup before that stretch, is going to be really helpful. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Coming off a year where you have bye week in like week three and you have to run that slate of like 11 straight games is really, really difficult. And it, it did add to how impressive TCU's uh, 2022 performance was. Um, mm-hmm. But it is nice to get uh, to get the love a little bit there to get a late bye week, and and certainly a, a just a brutal end of the schedule. I think that's going to be uh, you know 
that may be the four toughest games on the calendar and you have them all right in a row mm-hmm. um, to close the season going to Lubbock on a Thursday night. Um, that's going to be crazy. It's going to be wild. Just very nonsense is going to occur. Um, the, the tortillas will be flowing. Certainly. Um, let's see the thing that, that w- excited me the most, I think was getting BYU and getting BYU at home. Um, Definitely. You know, I'm, I'm an old man. So I was in school when, uh, when TC was playing BYU and it was a big rivalry. And, uh, what, one of my, my favorite ever TCU games was, um, the 2008 game against BYU. And that was my, this, I'm going to, you're now going to know exactly how old a man I am. That was my 21st birthday, uh, was, was the day before that game. And it was a Thursday night game and, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun and BYU came in ranked and were flying high. They were the top of the world. Their quarterback was on their way to be a Heisman contender and blah, blah, blah. And, and TCU crushed them and, and it was just a really fun time. And, and as in my old man nostalgia, it's one of my favorite games. And so I, I'm excited to see that game on that same weekend. So it'll be my birthday weekend this year. Uh, so I, I, it's going to be a party again. But instead of, you know, me going out with all the buddies and like storm of the field, uh, I'll uh, maybe I'll be there with my three kids. So it's, it's a di- myself. I'm different. We're, we're in different spaces, but it's, it's good to see uh, a rivalry like that. I mean, I, you know, I think there's probably some TCU fans who are a little bit like, ah, oh, let, let them toil in independence forever. But um, it, it's fun to, to get back together with that rivalry. I'll be looking forward to that one. I was lucky enough to uh, be a TCU fan at the BYU during the years of the BYU TCU rivalry. Both my parents went to TCU. So, I was before I got to TCU as a student, but I remember those days fondly, the battles with BYU and Utah too. Those were That's great. Yeah. Times. And I, I, the, the other things on the schedule, things that we already knew, um, obviously the season opener against, um, against Colorado is going to be a very interesting game. I think TCU is in a little bit of danger there. I think it's possible that's college game day. Um, I don't know what kind of the big giant games that are happening in like whatever in in Jerry's world or or in Georgia or wherever. Like I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure there's a few of those that maybe ESPN decides, but I mean I I don't know how you you get a bigger story than Deion Sanders' first game as a head coach at at the Power Five level against a, a team coming off a playoff run, a run to the national mm-hmm. championship game. So I I, I think. That will have, even if it's not college game day, it will have huge national attention and uh, will really set the tone for for the season. I mean, it, it could be Deion Sanders making this huge statement when on the road in Naaman G. Carter Stadium, or it can be, uh, you know, TCU coming out and, and looking strong in a new offensive system with a new quarterback and and new players all over the field. So, I think that's a big one, but you know, we, we knew that one was happening. <clears throat> the other game that, uh, that I'm, that I'm a li- that I'm pretty scared of is the Oklahoma to end the season. It will be Oklahoma's last regular season game in the conference, um, in Norman. And I, I- I'm sure, um, those fans will really be looking to send, to, to close their time in the big 12 with a win. Uh, so I think, I think that's a dangerous game for, for TCU. I, I think that might actually be on, on black Friday. I'm not remembering now, but so, you know, I think that that one intrigues me as well. What what else for you, Drew? Yeah, I think the Oklahoma game is going to be a big one. Um, I never like traveling to Ames, Iowa. That game always scares me, especially if you look, uh, at the games before it, we've got a TCU's got a pretty good chance to not have a loss coming into that Iowa State game, assuming we get past Colorado and um, the road game at Houston. But I think if we are undefeated going into Ames, Iowa, I think that atmosphere will be 
pretty crazy and weird things happen in Ames, Iowa. Yeah, most definitely. And, and I, I, that's, that's a big one. And obviously the, the Kansas state game back in Manhattan is going to be one of the games of the year um, mm-hmm. in the conference. Certainly the, the rematch from the, the conference championship game, they, they played, those two teams played two classics in 22 and, and will be, prime to to play another one again. I think Kansas State is going to be very strong again, even without uh Deuce Vaughn. So um the other the other thing from this schedule that's that's of notable is Oklahoma State, Central Florida, UCF. I know I guess they don't like being called Central Florida. I I didn't realize that. I I didn't I guess that's a thing. Don't call them Central Florida. And maybe it's just Knights and not Golden Knights. I don't know. They're, it's a very – that fan base is something. They they tried to take on all of the Big 12 Twitter, you know, since <laughs> since the schedule was released. And it was, you know, you know, whatever. Everybody's having good fun. Um, but, yeah, no UCF, no Oklahoma State, no Kansas, and no Cincinnati on the schedule. I think that, that makes for uh, – a very difficult schedule for TCU. I, I I do think it's possible Oklahoma State is one of the worst teams in the conference next season. Mm-hmm. Um, just given that they've had a pretty bad off season, I think. Um, and Kansas is better, but it would be in Fort Worth. And you know, would I rather play Kansas than Baylor? Yeah, I'd probably rather play Kansas than Baylor or Texas. I mean, not I. I want to have the rivalry with Baylor. We we want to play that right. game, but you know, as far as like difficulty of the schedule, I think Baylor's going to be a better team than Kansas. Texas will be a better team than Kansas. Um, and then from from the new guys, it, probably best to miss out Cincinnati. That's they're probably the the best uh, of the incoming new guys, but. Wouldn't have minded a trip to Orlando or, or sending uh, the alleged uh, UCF Twitter mafia to Fort Worth um, either. Uh, what do you think there? Yeah, I think um, part of this, part of the decision making from the Big 12 could have just been to reestablish some rivalries for the new, um, the new Big 12. I think they're losing probably their two most hated members of the Big 12, the ICC, and just having teams play other teams that are closer to them or had previous rival rivalries like TCU had with BYU. And then of course, TCU was in uh Southwest conference with Houston way back in the nineties. And uh, I think just playing teams geographically closer and playing teams that could potentially spark a rivalry was part of the decision-making process for the schedule builders for the big 12. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And, the other thing is, though, when when now that we have a schedule that is unbalanced, we've we've spent these many years now where everybody plays everybody, and it's very simple. Um, with the unbalanced schedule, there will be some teams who have easier schedules than others, and mm-hmm. uh, it's hard to project out which teams will be good and which won't. But I do think um, you know teams that do avoid. If they avoid Kansas State, avoid Oklahoma, avoid Texas, that really – I think those are, along with TCU, that's the top of the conference. And if you are if you don't have to play those teams, I think you're probably in a better position to uh, maybe look a little better in your conference record than you would have <clears throat> in the previous version of, of the Big 12 schedule. I think – Oklahoma and and, K- and Kansas State miss each other, which is unfortunate because I do think those are are two of the best teams, and maybe they'll see each other in Arlington. Uh, you know, if if our Horn Frogs aren't there. Yes, definitely. I think. Um, I mean, year to year, you're just gonna whether or not you have the benefit of an easier schedule or uh, just the challenge of playing a harder schedule. I think it'll be more fun though when you have a harder schedule some years, just to have bigger games to watch and be a part of, but also just have years where you're have have a little bit of a break here when you draw some easier opponents and have an easier path to bowl eligibility and 10 win seasons and conference championship berth. Yep. And, and I did mention it that this is the last year 
uh, for Texas and Oklahoma. And that was just more or less finalized tonight. We're recording Thursday. Um, so the big 12 put out a release. Uh, it, it went out through, um, reported several reported media outlets. So it, it's official Texas and Oklahoma after the 2023 season will be headed to the sec they will be forced to cut a big fat check to the Big 12 for a total of $100 million. Um, but, you know, I think that's uh, Brett Yormark, the new commissioner of the Big 12 and, and the Big 12 conference leaders really stood firm in their point of there, there's no incentive. We have no reason to let you out of your agreement. So, you know, you're obligated to pay this money or you have to stay through the end of this contract. So I, I think the SEC was hoping to bully the Big 12 out of that and, you know, pull Texas and Oklahoma in sooner. Um, and, and instead, everybody kind of gets what they wanted out of it. I, I, I don't think it really made a whole lot of sense to to keep them around in the conference for another extra year where... It's just kind of biding time, uh, waiting for them to leave. But you can't just let them go for nothing. It's a, it's a, it's obviously a valuable property. It's valuable to to the fans in the Big Twelve. It's valuable to uh, to the suits in the Big Twelve. So I, I think it ends up as a pretty win win case for everyone here, and it allows the Big Twelve to now say, "All right, we've settled that, and now we're on to the next thing." I think it's, I mean, obviously a benefit for the Big 12 teams remaining in the conference because they get the benefit of the buyout money. But also you're going to have one last big game if you drew UT and OU with a new schedule to have a big crowd to have one last shot at taking down um, UT and OU. I think you'll have bigger fan turnout and just bigger buzz around campus. And I think if you let them draw it out the the next year and – didn't let them buy out of the contract. I don't, I think it would just kind of be overblown and there wouldn't be as much hype leading up to the games, but I think getting the hundred million and letting them have one last revenge tour for the rest of the big 12 has worked out for both sides. Yeah. I like that. Knowing this is the end, it, it's helpful to have that end point. So we could just go mm -hmm. into this, the next opportunity to, to beat Texas and to beat Oklahoma will be the last, at least as members of the same conference. So um, mm -hmm. I guess what what do we think is next for the Big 12? Um, Big 12 has, you know, Brett Yormark has made it very clear that he's he's not settling. He's not done. He's listening to calls and, and he's reaching out to folks to uh, continue to do what's best for the Big 12. In in your opinion, Drew, what, what do you think is – best for the big 12 what do you think they're up to moving forward in in the conference realignment landscape i think the possibility of basketball only schools is really exciting is the big 12 is currently the best basketball conference in the nation by far i think college basketball as a whole is growing as a market and it's gonna lead to bigger television contract opportunities as i think nil has had a large part to do with it is college basketball players for example chuck o'bannon has stayed extra years in college to take advantage of NIL money. You're going to have better players staying in college for longer, and the level of play is going to get right, uh, going to be higher for college basketball, which is going to make it a bigger market and a bigger opportunity for schools. So I think the basketball only additions of potentially Gonzaga, maybe UConn, um, maybe St. Mary's, maybe Villanova. I think those are really intriguing for the Big Twelve. Yeah, I think. Uh... I like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Gonzaga is a, is a national brand at this point. It's way out there in the middle of nowhere from from the rest of the Big Twelve. But uh, and and yeah, Washington is is really far away. Uh, we think West Virginia is far away, but I, I I don't know. I haven't done the the math of of the mileage there. But I think I think Washington is probably further. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's an interesting opportunity there. Yeah, I mean, you've got like. Maybe Creighton, maybe Marquette is is a little more in the in the footprint of the Big Twelve. Um, so so there's some some opportunity there that that teams, uh, if that's what the Big Twelve, what you know, if they do the due diligence and that 
works out to be better for the Big 12 or a good opportunity. I think it's something that uh, those basketball only schools will will be really interested in in jumping into. Um, and, and like you said, for TV markets, I think that there's just so much inventory with college basketball that adding elite programs adds elite inventory to to television uh, contracts going forward. So, I mean, you know, a, a Kansas-Gonzaga game twice a year is – is going to do huge numbers. You can put it on your, you can put it on ABC, you can put it on CBS and it'll do big numbers. Um, so, you know, not college football numbers, but you know, nothing does college football numbers other than the NFL. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that is a big opportunity. The other big opportunity is what happens with the PAC 12. Clearly, um, we've seen the reporting this week that the PAC 12 is reaching out to, in particular, San Diego State and SMU uh, for potential addition to the conference with USC and UCLA leaving to the Big Ten. Um, you know, what, whatever there. I, th I think we can – we probably have our opinions about whether SMU should pl – plays anything at a, at a power conference level. Um, certainly their facilities are not to that level. Um, but – you know, maybe maybe they have plans in place, and and there's something going forward there. But I think it there would be an opportunity if if your mark really wants to uh, put the nail in the coffin of that conference and and put it really down a peg is to okay, you can have SMU and you can have San Diego State or Boise or whomever, uh, but we're taking the four corner schools. We're taking Colorado and Utah and Arizona and Arizona State. They're coming over to the Big Twelve, and uh, and and you're left with a with a glorified mountain West conference out there in the PAC 12, because at that point, then I still think I, I, until could proven otherwise, Oregon and Washington are going to go to the big 10. The big 10 is not done either. Somebody, somebody else is joining the big 10. Um, they have another move to make. I think that uh, the California schools headed to the big 10 will want some West coast travel partners. And, and it just makes sense for, for, the big brands in the Pacific Northwest to make that trip as well. So I think there's still more opportunity to come for the big 12 to, to continue to make moves, but I'm really excited for what this, this big 12, this next crazy 2023 season with 14 teams is going to look like. And then, uh, you know, if, if there's a steady state at the 12 that, that are currently left in the big 12, I think it's a really exciting conference across the board, basketball, football, uh, all the sports. Um, I, I think it'll be very competitive, a lot of intrigue, a lot of rivalries. So I'm excited for the future of the big 12. Definitely. I think um, what the funniest outcome of all this conference realignment for me would be to see the PAC 12 pick up SMU and our old foe Boise state from our mountain West conference days only for the big 10 to then poach. Oregon and Washington and then the big 12 to take the four corner schools and leave perfect. SMU and Boise state still in a, in a lower tier conference. Darn. You hate to see it for those guys. I mean, they, they've done so much to deserve all of that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Kidding aside. I think um, that's probably all we have on, on football as well. Um, moving on briefly to TCU men's tennis, um, and maybe not so briefly. We're all, we're only like forty minutes in here, so so we're gonna go deep on TCU men's tennis. I, I'm wearing my my TCU tennis shirt for the fort here. Uh, I don't know. I'm a big fan. I, I really enjoy the, this men's tennis team, and they've just been been really dominant. So um, this past week had three matches, all against top fifteen ranked opponents. And all on the road and earned team wins in all three um, with a 4-1 win in Knoxville over number 10, 10 Tennessee, uh, a 4-3, just a, a thriller against North Carolina in Chapel Hill and a 4-1 win against number 11 Baylor in Waco. Um TCU is just on a roll, undefeated to start the season, has not lost an indoor match in 20 matches. Um, 
TCU's won 10 straight overall on the road. Uh, the, the, the frogs are really good. They're, they're ranked number three in the country. Um, they go into next weekend is the indoor national championship tournament. Uh, so seating is not out yet. There's not a schedule yet. Um, hopefully we could get Russ to, to make his way out there to go to the tournament. The, the tournament is in Chicago. So may, maybe we'll get him to an opportunity to go out there. We'll see. But, um, I, and, and TCU won that tournament last season. So the, the frogs have a chance to repeat as indoor national champions and, and are just off to a, a blazing hot start again here in, in 2023. Definitely. I think the most impressive thing for me is in the last three victories over top 15 opponents, um, their top doubles pairing coming into the season has kind of struggled these last three matches, but they've been able to win the other two doubles matches and secure the doubles point against Tennessee, North Carolina, and Bay- Baylor's. Sandra Jong and Louis Maxted were the number one preseason ITA ranked doubles pairing, I think, and even through them kind of going through a slump, hopefully they can get back to their usual forms the TCU has been able to continue to have their doubles dominance with Luke Fombo and Jake Burnley. Uh, they, I think they took over the number one doubles pairing against Baylor, but they've been really dominant lately. And just to survive kind of a rough patch from their, for TCU's original top doubles pairing has been really impressive. Yeah. That TCU has not dropped the doubles point yet this season, um, which is, is impressive and certainly helps push them towards these, these team victories. Um, the, the singles matches have been exciting. I think that North Carolina match, all of these actually had pretty good ability to watch on live stream. So um, I don't, I don't know how it'll be set up for the indoor national championship, um, but generally go frogs or, you know, the TCU men's tw- uh, tennis Twitter page or somebody will give you, uh, how to to link to to watch live streams if it's available. Um, but watch it, watching that North Carolina match, um, it came down to the final set of the final matchup, the final duel, and it, uh, yeah, Louis King Louis. Uh, he he's been exciting to watch this season. He's done this a couple times where he uh, he just doesn't give up. He he comes back and and ends up winning in in the three sets. Uh, there to to give TCU the win, um, and yeah, you you mentioned Famba earlier too, and he he hasn't lost yet this season as in singles. He's he's seven and zero. Oh. Um, <clears throat> he's he's been TCU's most dominant singles player, um, and, and really, I, I I didn't take note of all of the rankings here, but there's. You know, TCU is in the like top 120. Uh, almost the entire men's squad is ranked in the singles top 120, something like that. So, um, really exciting. I, I think that's so. This that's the end of the indoor season uh, for the Frogs, and you know, obviously culminating with the national championship next weekend. So, after that, going forward, everything's at the outdoor. So, if if there's a if there's a home match. Um, and the weather's nice. Go out there to to catch a, a match. It's it's a super fun time. Um, the indoor seating's not great, but the outdoor seating is. There's plenty. There's plenty of room. So uh, so tell everyone you know. Go go watch some TCU men's tennis. Definitely. Um, yeah, and for, yeah, for the indoor national championship, I watched the live stream for that last year, and they had a really good setup from what I can remember. I think they even had a couple guys uh, commentating as well. They did a good job switching between courts and just keeping you up with the action. Yeah, that's great. So um, let's see. A couple other things I don't have on my notes here, but I I thought to talk about. We've got TCU baseball coming up uh, next weekend. They they take on uh, Vanderbilt in the the season opener in Arlington at at the Rangers ballpark out there. Um, I think that is – not very well live streamed. I think you have to pay like thirty bucks to watch that tournament. So uh, we might be box score watching that one, folks. If, mm-hmm. uh, if if we're not in the stadium, so um, what that means is get yourself a ticket and get out there to to Arlington. Go to Globe Life and um, 
and support the frogs here in the 2023 campaign as that gets underway. And it's going to be uh, some really massive contests. Got Vanderbilt up first and then Arkansas after that. Um, I think Missouri is the third game, but mm -hmm. certainly Vanderbilt and Arkansas are perennial powerhouses in, in college baseball. So um, really exciting there. Russ has been uh, working hard putting out some season preview stuff so on the website. So go to frogsofwar.com and, and check out everything we've been uh, been putting up there. And we'll have you, you covered throughout the season as well, certainly. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention was uh, the – NFL Draft Combine uh, invitations went out and nine TCU Horn Frogs were invited to the Combine, uh, which is is an incredible number. Um, that is the most in the Big 12. It's tied for third most in all of college football behind just Georgia and Alabama. So, <clears throat> you know, it's just a, a, another testament to the elite level of talent that TCU had on its roster for this 22 season, you know, this, this was not a fluke. This was, this was a very strong team uh, that made its way to the national championship game. And it, it also goes to show there's a lot to, there's a lot to replace coming going forward. Um, there, there's a lot of holes to fill in that 2023 roster that, um, will be very interesting to, to see how that, that goes. But um, a few Horn Frogs competed in the senior bowl. I, I think Russ touched on that a little bit last week, but um, the senior bowl game is kind of whatever, similar to like the pro bowl game is kind of whatever. Um, the Frogs didn't perform super great during the actual game day, but during practice week, there were, were a lot of big praise. I think Steve Avila was the big mover, um, just uh, received a ton of praise. He's moving up draft boards. I, I've seen him very close to a first round um, in these mock drafts. So, you know, he, he continues to put on a good show at Pro Days, a uh, good show at the Combine, and, and he might find himself there at the back end of the first round. I saw a couple clips of D winners as well. I think he had a couple of interceptions in some of the drills and there was a really awesome clip of him just dusting a running back, rushing the passer when the running back was trying to pass protect. That was pretty cool that, to see as well. That's a, that's a nightmare drill for a running back. I, I have to Definitely. feel like you, you, you've got these big old linebackers sprinting at you, you know, 10 yards unimpeded right at you and you got to try to get in their way. That's a, that's a tough one, but yeah, the, D winners looked really good in the practices. Um, you know, I, I got to watch a little bit of it. There, it was broadcast. The practices were broadcast on ESPN, and um, so got to see a little bit of it. He really impressed. I thought Max Duggan was really good in, in in his drills, and particularly in the team portion of drills, he was he was finding the tight end, um, and and you know, I, I I think I think he will get drafted. I'm not sure he's going to work his way even into like the fourth or fifth round, but I think he will be drafted and he'll be given a shot in an NFL camp for sure. Definitely. I'm interested to see his combine numbers because uh, as TCU fans know, he's a really athletic quarterback. I'm interested to see his 40 time and just some of the testing numbers for him. And he measured with huge hands. So I know that's uh, th th there's a lot of people out there who that's like their number one measurement when they're evaluating quarterbacks. There's, I think there's like a threshold, like you can't be below whatever. But uh, he, he measured in, in, you know, the top percentile there. I think I, I went and did the research. I don't know it now. I tweeted it out, but it was, you know, something like, I don't know, five starting quarterbacks in the NFL had larger hands than he measured at the senior bowl. So, you know. Uh, he'll be able to hold on to the football. That's what that means. Um, <laughs> all right. We're not going to spend any more time on that. Um, but, you know, I, obviously we did not get to see uh, Kendra Miller or Quentin Johnston in any of those uh, seniors only pre-draft showcases. So um, they're, they're certainly have lots of buzz for them as well, but uh they'll get the first opportunity to really get in front of scouts at, at pro day and then at, at the combine. Um, and then the NFL draft coming up uh, in April, I guess. So um, that's all I have. 
I think that's all I have for the show tonight. Drew, Drew, you have any um, any words of wisdom to to close us out? Anything else to touch on? Shout out TCU Rifle, bringing home the oh yeah, absolutely PRC conference championship. I think freshman Julie Johannesson shot like a perfect score in air rifle and one point or two, one or two points below perfect score in small bore, which was a NCAA record for small bore shooting. So that was really cool to see. We are uh, TCU is a rifle school, as everyone knows, that's, that's the top program on the campus. So um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's, they, they, they've been fantastic and, and performing at even better than their, their typical, um, elite level. I mean, the, the, the perfect scores coming out and um, really impressive stuff out of the rifle team. Uh, certainly all across campus, there's there's great stuff happening. I think uh, I'm not going to end it on the down note. Women's basketball needs to catch up a little bit. We're, we're still winless in conference. Uh, it's uh, it's another tough season for, for the Lady Frogs there. But um, other than that, I think, you know, equestrians pick it up. Golf will actually – we'll close all this. So the, the TCU golf team uh, was scheduled to start a tournament in, in Hawaii this week. Opening the season, you get to you, – you go to Hawaii, you, you get to open your season there. Turns out they are not – they canceled the tournament because of, of extreme weather, extreme winds, like 60-mile-an-hour winds. Nobody they, they tried to go out and play, and, and none of the competitors could play. So – uh, instead they just get to hang out at Hawaii. So congratulations to the TCU golf team for, uh, for their trip to Hawaii for, uh, <laughs> I'm sure they'd love to be playing golf at Hawaii. I mean, who wouldn't, but, uh, you know, the, the trip to Hawaii can't be that bad. Yeah. No, they're definitely winning as a team. They, didn't go they, they won. They, they didn't <laughs> yeah. even have to compete and they won. They won. Yep. <clears throat> All right. So that, that'll close it out. Uh, Really appreciate Drew you coming on and and joining me on this podcast tonight, and um, look forward to to all the things we have coming up, um, covering basketball season and and the start of baseball season and everything else. TCU athletics. Um, follow us on Twitter, on YouTube, everywhere. Subscribe where you get your podcasts. We we thank everybody for listening and and for for following us everywhere, reading our stuff, uh, commenting. Uh, into the posts on the website and um, you know, we, we appreciate the engagement and, and certainly enjoy covering TCU athletics uh, for all of you. And, and with that, we'll close it. Go frogs. Go frogs. <laughs>